Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, is a conspiracy theorist. He believes that a shadowy elite is plotting to establish an all-powerful new world order, a world government that will destroy anyone who disobeys them. McVeigh considered the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City to be local New World Order headquarters. His bombing was the strategic act of a conspiracy theorist with military training to stop the New World Order. Two days ago, the FBI admitted to withholding 3,000 documents relating to the Oklahoma City bombing. McVeigh's execution has now been stayed for 30 days. Conspiracy theorists believe that these documents might relate to a bizarre neo-Nazi love affair, a mysterious German, a white separatist community called Elohim City, and a strip club in Tulsa. This conspiracy theory has led many people to believe that the New World Order itself had a hand in the bombing. There are two stories of the Oklahoma bomb. Both stories seem as convincing and as unbelievable as each other. McVeigh really was a, a creature of his own co pop culture. Lou Michelle and Dan Herbeck are local journalists from Timothy McVeigh's hometown. They're the only journalists McVeigh has let into his life for any significant time. The story they tell is the story McVeigh wants the world to know. He loved shows like uh, Little House on the Prairie because he loved the frontier spirit of that show. He loved Sylvester Stallone's soldier movies. And he also loved science fiction. And a friend of his asked McVeigh, how can you justify blowing up a federal building where you're going to have all kinds of secretaries and he cited the movie Star Wars and he said that when the Death Star was blown up everyone cheered and no one cared about the fact that some of the people who were on the Death Star were probably just secretaries so even secretaries were fair game to McVeigh Timothy McVeigh did not bond with his parents, but he did bond with his grandfather, Ed McVeigh. And Ed used guns as a tool to teach McVeigh responsibility. And later in life, when he saw that the federal government was trying to restrain the Second Amendment or chip away at it, McVeigh took that very personally because the only man that he said he ever loved in his life, he could say it unabashedly, without reserve, was Edward McVeigh. Shortly after his 18th birthday, he came over and I have a favor I want to ask you. Will you sign my pistol permit? And I remember giving him a little <laughs> talk and um, Guns have only one purpose, and that's to kill. And but in the end, I did sign the. I was kind of surprised you did sign it, really. Well, now if you come over to me, I would have just immediately signed it because I don't happen the whole. I think guns are not all bad. There is a conspiracy theory at the heart of the American Constitution. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, is there to protect the people against a government that can become tyrannical. McVeigh, like millions of others, felt that the government's clampdown on gun owners was a tyrannical act. McVeigh, in immersing himself in the gun show culture, came across the philosophies of the New World Order, and that was abhorrent to him a single government guiding the world. He felt that the, the rights of citizens would be taken away. We'd no longer be citizens, but subjects. The gun shows are where McVeigh, working under an alias, began to be noticed by his peer group. I've heard of a Tim Tuttle. Tim Tuttle was, <laughs> there was a real good patriot named Tim Tuttle who was 
highly decorated army guy from uh, the Gulf War was a really good patriot. So did you meet Tim Tuttle? Yes, I did meet Tim Tuttle. I didn't know his name was Tim Tuttle or Tim McVeigh. He was set up at Tulsa Gun Shows under an assumed name. And uh, I remember because he always had real short hair and a real, a real, the real intense eyes and the real no, long, narrow nose like yours. Nose like yours, yeah. It's good nose, don't get me wrong. Better than mine, mine's been broke. I run into Tim Tuttle at some of the gun shows. Fascinating fellow. Fascinating fellow. But he tried to sell me a 37 millimeter rocket launcher. This is a 20 millimeter shell, okay? Now think about a 37 millimeter shell, man. I mean, you get my drill? I said, look here, I don't need to kill elephants, man, you know? And he said, well, when the black helicopters come to get you, you know, you can put a little warhead on it and take them down. I thought that was kind of cute. He had a good sense of humor. Some conspiracy theorists say that the majority of gun show attendees are actually undercover government agents, either for the FBI or for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the ATF, a gun control agency. The deal was, I would go to all these gun shows and flea markets and stuff, and I would deliver at least ten people that were serious. They had a list of people they wanted. And Tim Tuttle's name has come up many times with ATF from his gun show stuff because he was talking some wild stuff at the gun shows. We were talking once about, you know, Wake, Wake over Ruby Ridge, and I said, you know, it's, uh, what, what comes around goes around. Uh, I can't believe that if they keep doing this terrorism on our people, so that terrorism's going to happen to them. That's he said, what he said to you. That's what you said to him. That's what, he said, that's what I said to him. He said, probably, probably, probably so. In the early 1990s, the U.S. government launched a series of assaults on gun owners. In one, at Ruby Ridge, Idaho, an FBI sniper called Lon Horiuchi shot Vicki Weaver as she stood in her cabin doorway holding her baby. A day earlier, U.S. Marshals had shot her son, Sammy, in the back as he was running away from an ambush. McVeigh was even angry to the point that at gun shows he was handing out uh, little cards with an address where people could find Juan Horiuchi, the uh, sharpshooter from the FBI at Ruby Ridge. So this was something that occupied him for years. In February 1993, the ATF raided David Koresh's church at Waco. There had been reports that David Koresh was stockpiling weapons. This is for the little children, right? God knows how it should be. Stars and stripes are flying, give us justice and liberty for the children's sake. You know, you might have to bear a gun one day. Timothy McVeigh was horrified by the ATF's assault on the church. He considered it a PR stunt designed to deflect the bad publicity the government was getting for the killings of Vicky and Sammy Weaver. McVeigh visited Waco during the siege and he handed out leaflets. He was not alone in criticizing the ATF's handling of the raid. I have great concerns with the initial raid carried out by the ATF. Uh, personally would never have approved such a raid. To carry it out in that manner was was outrageous. So to me, it looks like uh, certain leaders in the ATF decided to make a, a big grandstand. On April the 19th, 1993, the FBI decided to end the siege at Waco. For the anti-government movement, Bob Ricks became the personification of the New World Order. As far as I'm concerned, Ricks is guilty of killing those people in Waco. I just hope that his family would go through the same thing, 51 days of hell. Just because I was on camera, that's the only reason. Uh, that nobody knew me or knew what I stood for, but uh, because I was the, probably the, the one most uh, visible to everyone. Uh, so that, that's the only reason I incurred their wrath. The burning of David Koresh's parishioners, including 23 children, was broadcast live on TV. McVeigh stood staring at his television set for 10 minutes, unable to say a word with tears coming out of his eyes. He was fighting the New World Order, and he thought what he did was 
warfare, guerrilla warfare. He thought he was tit for tat. A line in the sand had been drawn and the government had stepped over it and he was ready to strike back in retaliation. He said that violence was his last resort. But why that building? The Alfred P. Moa building in Oklahoma City had long been a target for anti-government terrorists. In 1983, two men, James Ellison and Richard Wayne Snell, plotted to blow up the Moa building. What he actually asked me to do was he asked me to manufacture a rocket launcher so that he could position this rocket launcher and uh, set it off with a timer and do damage on the front of the building at night. The reason they were blowing up the Oklahoma federal building at that time, it was the mostly racially mixed federal building in the United States at that time, and that's the reason they wanted to take it out. They only abandoned their plan when the rocket launcher they'd been testing blew up in their hands. They took it as a sign that God didn't want them to go ahead with the plot. Many conspiracy theorists believe that Snell's 1983 plot is an important clue in the mystery of who really did blow up the Moa building 12 years later. But McVeigh's official biographers say there is no mystery. He looked in the phone book, he noticed that the ATF were in one particular federal office building he went by and scoped out the building and he thought this would make a great target for my bomb. He wanted a building that would be photogenic, that would provide a photo opportunity for the media once it had been destroyed. The official story goes that McVeigh also chose Oklahoma City because Bob Ricks was based there. He also said that he wanted to kill as many of the ATF officers stationed in the Moa building as possible. But his plans backfired. It turned out that Bob Ricks was based at another building across town. Oscar Johnson was the Moa building's elevator service engineer. We had six men on the site within five minutes after the bombing to help check all the elevators and and continue to help with the rescue at the time. When uh, I was given a copy of the floor plan of the building, it showed where all the people were when the, the bomb blast went off. What are the numbers? The uh... number identifies them by person. The square boxes are fatalities. The notched out area where the, the, the floor collapsed is where all the fatalities were. There were 19 children in the daycare center. There was a daycare inside the building. And uh, imagine the callousness of setting off a bomb where children are inside. It's mind-boggling. I do know what probably happened with Tim because the Army does teach you you're being trained for war. And what is a war? It's killing other people. And they try and eliminate any feeling of guilt. This is the mentality he was using. I mean, especially, I mean, we cried when we heard about collateral damage. Kids. Terrible. This is why I don't go on television very often, because I, I get tricked. I do. McVeigh says he had no idea that the daycare center was there. He's tried to salvage the situation, stating that children are often killed in NATO raids in the Balkans and the Middle East. But it's clear that the daycare center has ruined his political statement. In his most recent statements, which are so inflammatory about killing babies and, and how he, they just sort of got in the way, this collateral damage stuff, indicates to me that he's given up any hope of becoming a popular mythical hero. And he's decided, well, I'm going to go down with my pals in the movement, and at least I'll get respect from them. He's going to be a martyr to the movement. And don't get me wrong, I'm sorry the kids got killed there. But you know something? I never heard any Oklahomans, you know, raise hell about the federal government, what they did to Waco. Most Okies were said, I'm glad they killed them off. They're a bunch of crazy people. And Tim McVeigh was a Satan worshiper, which he wasn't. But almost all the Okies were 100% behind that massacre. So, hey, you got, you got 108, 100, 
68 people dead. Too bad. Even though McVeigh wanted to kill as many ATF officers as he could, their office was nearly empty that morning. Do you know how many people are supposed to have been in that ATF office? I'd probably estimate 10 or 12. Actually, one of these guys was a DEA. This is how the conspiracy theory began. Where were the ATF officers that day? The militia movement has been heavily infiltrated by the ATF. Could the Bureau have had some forewarning of the bomb? And then conspiracy theorists began to hear of a strange love affair between an Oklahoman society girl called Carol Howe and the neo-Nazi Dennis Mahan. This is the love affair at the heart of the conspiracy theory. There are a series of strange facts that have led conspiracy theorists to believe that not only did McVeigh act with others, but that these others are being protected by a government with something to hide. The story begins with a bizarre neo-Nazi love affair. Carol Howe was a debutante with a millionaire father, but she got in with a druggy crowd and she jumped off a roof and broke her feet. While she was convalescing, she began to telephone the local dial a racist hotline. The international corporations and Jews and banks control America, and are out to enslave and destroy the white race. I somewhat got hooked on it and started to call whenever it would change um, to hear and learn new, new and interesting things. Carol fell in love with the voice as she lay in her sick bed. The voice belonged to Dennis Mahan. She contacted me first, and she wanted to help, you know, fight for the white race. And I, I felt so like, look here, here's a young woman, a beautiful young woman, hobbling around crutches, trying to fight for our race. And I just, my heart went out to her. This is Carol, one of the pictures of Carol that I took. And she was strikingly beautiful, she was, and highly intelligent, super high IQ. I think she had an IQ of 130, way up there. Oh yeah, here's a nice picture of Carol with shooting her AK-47. Within hours of meeting Carol, Dennis had formulated some big plans for her. I was going to get some talk shows like Oprah and a few others where they could get her on the air because most of our women are not very intelligent. And all they can say is nigger this and nigger that. Did you fall in love with her? I tried not to. I really did. I tried to keep on a professional level, but it was very hard not to because I, 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 I wanted to keep her healthy. I was adopted, and, and that's why I guess I always been looking for my identity and who I am and where I come from and where am I going. I got a bit weak. I did fall in love with her and I did uh, had an intimate relationship with her. And uh, I finally said, just, just forget about this whole thing and just get married. And the best thing we can do is have children. Let's have some beautiful white children. But no, she wanted to get into the guns, get into the explosives. Their love affair flourished. Carol began recording dial a racist messages too. You better pick up your weapons and start eliminating the Jews that have infested our government. I made some rudimentary explosives for her and let them all out in the woods. And she, and she uh, got off. I mean, she's, I mean, like, I mean, she couldn't make love to me fast enough. <laughs> and uh, it, it, she, it's just, uh, it was, it, actually, she liked the danger more than, than sex, I think. Carol broke up with Dennis after he threatened to kill her. She called the police. Oh, Jesus. This is some of the terrible things uh, that people said about me and Carol said that I raped her. That's how the local ATF heard about her. They asked her to become an undercover informant and spy on Dennis for them. She agreed. I thought I was doing a very important thing. I had been so honored that the ATF would come to me and ask me to work for them as an informant. Dennis took Carol back, unaware she was now working for the ATF. But Dennis says he knew their relationship wouldn't work. He says he wanted to see her happy. He wanted her to meet boys. So he took her to a local heavily armed compound called Elohim City. It's a white separatist community. Uh, they've got, they're fundamentalists, but it's really nice. Not a lot of good single men out there. And that was Elohim City. But I did tell those people out there, she really likes to make bombs. For conspiracy theorists, Elohim City is the linchpin of the story. In the months before the Oklahoma bombing, Carol filed a series of reports to the ATF about the white separatists at Elohim City. The conspiracy investigator, J.D. Cash, 
managed to get copies of them. To give you an idea of the type of intelligence that Carol provided, she advises that Mahon has detonated explosives at Elohim City. Elohim City is preparing for a war against the United States government. They support violence against the government. Andreas Strassmeyer is an illegal alien, is head of security at EC. Um, he served in the West German military. His stated plans are to forcibly act to destroy the United States government with direct actions such as assassinations, bombings, and mass shootings. Of all those living at Elohim City, Carol said the most mysterious was the German, Andreas Strassmeyer. Carol told the ATF that Strassmeyer was plotting to blow up a federal building. She advises uh, that she had seen Strassmeyer and McVeigh together at Elohim City. When I first interviewed her, she told me that she had seen them together. And the name was Tim Tuttle. Was, she'd heard that name several times before the bombing. Elohim City individuals stated that they had access to grenades, C4, plastic explosives, and other explosives, and are said to have machine guns. After all I'd heard about Elohim City, I felt a little intimidated as I drove up into the Ozark Mountains towards the place. It was on this stretch of road that McVeigh received a speeding ticket in October 1993, just a few miles from Elohim City. Could it be true that the plot to blow up the Moa building was hatched there between McVeigh and Andreas Strassmeyer? My instructions were to stay in the car and honk my horn until somebody came to fetch me. I wondered why I had to sit there and honk. Had the people there been told to stop doing whatever it was when the honking journalist arrived? Somebody over here. Hi. Wes, we've come to see the Reverend Malar. Okay, thanks. So after all I'd heard about Elohim City, it was a happy surprise that they'd organized a performance of River Dance to welcome me. It was a busy day at Elohim City. Not only had a visiting chiropractor called Dr. Buzz come to give massages, but a traveling salesman was here to sell Elohim City soap powder. Antibacterial soap for your hands, soap for your sink, your shampoo. You don't need conditioner with this water, just shampoo. And your bath bar. This bath bar lasts up to about 25 times longer than the bar you're using now. It's been proven over and over again. This is not a game, it's very serious. Water is serious nowadays. Yes, it is. Well, there's nothing more valuable than good health. And These are tense times at Elohim City. The group's leader, Reverend Malar, has been told that the ATF have long been discussing a Waco-style raid on these heavily armed white separatists. In fact, a standoff was recently averted at the last minute. They came in here, they had ten armed men here. They said they had more in the bush and they had a airplane overhead. I happened to have been forewarned and we had a number of men in camouflage with many 14s. I said that's not a proper warrant and you know it isn't. Get your men off this place. And that was close to the end of that. The FBI's head of operations at Waco, Bob Ricks, confirms this story. All of a sudden I heard ATF was running operations over there against uh, Elohim City. And so I demanded a meeting with the head of the ATF and, and uh, wanted to know exactly what they were going to do because we didn't want to have to come up and clean up another mess. Right, because you didn't want another Waco. Right. And you uh, Millar made it clear, if you come in here with guns blazing, my people will shoot back. For all the circumstantial evidence, Reverend Millar says that Timothy McVeigh has never stepped foot in his place. I don't think he was ever here at all. But I do think 
it's likely that he made a phone call. I don't know that he did. But he, it's possible that he made a phone call and asked for Andy Strassmeyer. He might have been looking for a, a place to light, you know, a resting place for him. So do you think that Timothy McVeigh phoned Andy Strassmeyer because he was thinking this could possibly be a hideout? It's possible. That's possible. I think that's possible. It's a guess. It's conjecture. It's not a statement. But I think it's possible. Do you remember Carol Howe? Carol Howe? Yes. Uh, a pretty little girl. I refer to her as a poor little rich girl. What kind of stuff was she saying about this place? One of it was that uh, we had, uh, I think, prepared a bomb or discussed that sort of thing or something very violent. And as you can see, that's hardly typical of us here. The word for seventh is Shabiki. This is the earth. The sun is at its zenith. Now we begin Yom Shabiki. As I watched Elohim City's church service, I was reminded of Richard Wayne Snell, who'd plotted to blow up the Moa building in 1983. A few years after his plot failed, Snell was sentenced to death for murder. Got out of my van, and I shot Officer Bryan twice from the hip. Snell's execution date was set for April the 19th, 1995. The people at Elohim City knew that this was coming, that his last, he'd run out of appeals, and that, but they were just amazed when the date was set of April the 19th. April the 19th is a holy day for anti-government activists. Not only was it the two-year anniversary of Waco, it is also Patriots Day, the day militias celebrate independence from British tyranny. Now, I'll guarantee you, Richard Wayne Snell didn't set the date. Right-wing people didn't set the date. Government agents arranged April the 19th. It's sort of like in your face. Patriotic Americans celebrate that day. And on that day, you have Waco, the execution of Snell, and uh, it just looks like as if there was a in-your-face attempt to provoke. Wayne Snell's family lives at Elohim City. That's motive. This is motive. It was just like all the stars had aligned. Something was violent was going to happen. On the morning of Snell's execution, just as Timothy McVeigh's yellow rider truck pulled up outside the Moa building in Oklahoma City, Snell asked his guard if he could watch the TV news. The guard turned the television on. Looking at the uh, north side of the building, which I'm doing now, basically the building's gone. I mean, it's just blackened rubble. Snell had already warned prison guards that his death would be avenged. And now, the penitentiary's death watch log noted, Richard Wayne Snell watched the breaking news, and he smiled and chuckled. Shortly afterwards, he was executed by lethal injection. Conspiracy theorists believe that Snell's behavior that morning indicated that he knew the bombing was going to happen. This was a bomb Snell himself had plotted with an Elohim City resident, James Ellison, 12 years earlier. So where are we now? We're at our cemetery. We don't believe in people dying, but they do. How many people are buried here? All the dead ones. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you recording this? I'm sorry. And here's Richard Wayne Snell. This is the one you want. I think he's rightly called a patriot. Why is he buried here? He requested it. He asked that he be buried here. Could Snell's execution be the trigger for the Oklahoma City bombing? Did Timothy McVeigh really meet with Elohim City's Andy Strassmeyer in the weeks before the bombing? This is the Lady Godiva strip club in Tulsa. The Lady Godiva is an unwitting part of the conspiracy theory 
because its owner, Floyd, has a security camera in the dressing room. Why do you have cameras in the dressing room? Unfortunately, in this line of work, um, a lot of the girls are good girls. Um, it keeps down thievery, keeps them from stealing from each other, it keeps down drugs. The club's owners, Floyd and Julie, usually erase the tapes after two weeks. But on the night of April the 8th, 1995, two strippers got into a fight in the dressing room. Floyd and Julie found the cat fight to be funny, so they gave the tape to a friend in Arkansas. And I guess being nosy, he went ahead and watched the tape all the way through. And as he's watching the rest of the tape, uh, he realizes that the girls are talking about, quite possibly, the guys that blew up the federal building. As the cat fight was occurring, three men in the club were bragging to some of the strippers about how smart and rich they were and how they were going to be famous 11 days later. Yeah, and he goes, yeah, I'm a very smart man. I said, you are? And he goes, yeah. He's like, oh, really? And he goes, yeah. And you're going to remember me on April 1995. You're going to remember me for the rest of your life. Okay. When Floyd and Julie realized what they had, they called the FBI. A couple of agents come to the club, talked to the girls involved, showed them pictures. The girls did a did identify uh, these guys that were in the club. McVeigh and uh, the other gentleman, Schlossmeyer, Strassmeyer. Strassmeyer, excuse me. Um, they all did identify the gentleman. And of course, everyone's heard of McVeigh and nobody's heard of Strassmeyer. No, but the girls did identify Strassmeyer. The agents at that time says, we'll just, we don't know if it's going to go to court, we'll just kind of put it on the back burner and let it set. Well, that's where it's been. This is, what, five years later and it's still on the back burner. Because with Stressmeyer, I don't know if he's, uh, if it's a cover-up, trying to protect him. It seems like the more we find out, the less we want to know. In the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, President Clinton promised that no stone would be left unturned. We will find the people who did this. When we do, justice will be swift, certain, and severe. 20,000 individuals were interrogated, but Andy Strassmeyer was never questioned. He left the U.S. 18 months after the bombing, and he now lives in Germany. Here's something to think about. Andreas Strassmeyer. Who is this guy? Who is he? Is he a legitimate terrorist living in this country illegally? Back in Phoenix, Dennis Mahan said he wanted to tell me something he'd never told anyone before about Andy Strassmeyer. The way he disappeared, and uh, with his expertise, I, I, no, I, I, I think that me may have been involved. I, I, I feel, I have a gut feeling that he was involved. I do. Or at least he knew about it. Because I've been trying to contact him for years. And, I, and I've always, I've always defended him. I, and he won't return my letters. He won't return my phone calls. I can't get his phone number now. And, uh, I've been banned from Germany. Why is that? Uh, and the way, the way he, he went to Mexico and went and in, into France and then in Germany. Where did he get that kind of money at? He did not pay for that ticket in advance. That ticket, the day he paid for the tickets, he got on that flight. That was at least $1,500, maybe $2,000. So who might have paid for the tickets? I don't know. I know I didn't. <laughs> it turns out that Andy Strassmeyer's father is Gunter Strassmeyer, Helmut Kohl's Secretary of State, the man known as the architect of German reunification. Could it be possible that Carol Howe was not the only undercover federal informant at Elohim City? Or didn't you have another informer there too, working for the FBI at the same time? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. That's what we're I not, heard. We're not sure of that. But if, the, if there was, that would have been Andy Strassmeyer. Conspiracy theorists believe that Carol Howe and Andy Strassmeyer warned the government that a bombing was going to happen 
and this is why, they say, the ATF office was almost empty that morning. But why might the ATF have allowed this bomb to go off? Were they trying for a big splash to make up for their disaster at Waco? Did they hope to catch McVeigh red-handed with the bomb, but McVeigh somehow slipped through the net? An ATF officer later said that he was in the elevator when the bomb went off with a DEA agent. But Oscar Johnson, the Moa building's elevator engineer, says this could not have happened. Our servicemen checked the elevator immediately after the blast and there wasn't anybody on any of the elevators. I don't know why they would have to lie about it. And I think they said it fell from the ninth floor to three. Which, uh... None of the elevators had any indication. They have overspeed devices that are manually reset. None of those devices were tripped. And uh, I didn't make up this story. All I did was state the facts as they were. So you weren't a conspiracy theorist before any of this? No. Just didn't be an engineer? Yeah. You know, I've told a lot of people about this and very little of it's ever gotten to there. Uh, I guess I'm considered a radical now. So. John Peeler, the ex-ATF informant, has an even more startling theory as to why the ATF might have allowed the bomb to happen. McVeigh's ex-lawyers told us that John Peeler may appear eccentric, but he has an important story to tell. Three weeks before the Oklahoma bombing, I call the Secret Service up and tell them, look, I'm talking to all these guys and they're all telling me that Oklahoma, to watch it on TV, is going to be blown up on that time and day. And Richard Wayne Snell's going to watch it on TV, is what they're all saying. And I said, this don't sound good to me. One of the reasons that they let this building get blown up, they were about to do away with a hell of a lot of the budget of the ATF. But what happened? After the Oklahoma bombing, instead of being out of work and out of jobs, they hired three times more agents. And their budget just went out through the roof. They all knew it was going to happen. They didn't stop it. The New World Order wanted it to happen to show that terrorism is on the rise. They need more gun control, more federal agents. The conspiracy theory, point by point, is persuasive. But when you put it all together, you arrive at a very strange place. It seemed that only two men could solve the mystery. But McVeigh wasn't talking, and Strassmeyer was in hiding. Could he be found? Dennis Mahan is a conspiracy theorist, but he says he doesn't believe the conspiracy theory that he was involved in the Oklahoma bomb. After all, after that bombing, the FBI's budget, well, they got $400 million for domestic terrorism investigation. Think of that, $400 million bucks extra. That's why they're following me, guys like me around everywhere. They, you know, they got to spend that money somehow. Uh, and also the ATF got a big shot in the arm. And of course Clinton, his ratings went way up. You know, you wonder about it. You do, you do. One of the strangest facts in all of this is the story of the ATF officer who said he was in the elevator when the bomb went off. How could the ATF have got it wrong about the whereabouts of their staff? Whether the person was in the elevator or not in the elevator, and, and the elevator fell or didn't fall, uh, uh, I have no idea about uh, about that situation. I do know the, pe the, the people involved were in that building. Uh, if you have a 7,000 pound bomb goes off and, and literally takes off half of the building, uh, I think it's many people have said things after that that turned out not to be completely accurate after their brains were scrambled. The one man who it seemed could solve the mystery was Andy Strassmeyer. It did seem odd that the son of Helmut Kohl's Secretary of State was living in the woods at Elohim City. We managed to track Andy Strassmeyer down to Germany. He asked that we didn't show his face. Can you see why people think that you're a very mysterious figure? Yes, because I've been portrayed like that. I, I prefer to live in a log cabin in the wood than being a rich yuppie. And I think basically that did it to me. That somebody with an edu with college education, comes from an upper middle class family uh, from Europe, lives on a mountainside. In a, it happened that my father is a politician uh, in the German government, and that spices the story up as well. 
Well, I hate to say this, and I, and I really do hate to say mm. this, because I don't know. I'm, I, mm. I don't know what's true and what's not true in this, mm. in this mysterious saga, but Reverend Millard did say to us that he thought that you were mm -hmm. uh, an agent. Yeah. Does that, is that upsetting to you? Yes. Why? Well, because I did consider him a friend, you know, and uh, what really upsets me because he knows better. Why would he say it? Maybe he's telling you something to get you off his back. I don't know. I, I, you know let's look at the facts. There was a chance meeting of McVeigh and me, and I met him in Tulsa at a gun show. Actually, it's a coincidence that I did, didn't meet McVeigh more than one time, because we used to go in the same gun shows. But you were seen with him at the Lady Godiva strip club. It's a funny, I always hear that name Lady Godiver, and I think I remember every strip club I've been in in my life, but I've never been there. And I would remember. <laughs> Supposedly, the only evidence was a, a, video, a security camera filming a conversation between two dancers, basically saying, look, there's a really weird guy sitting out there. I don't think there's any footage of McVeigh or... Uh, the other thing I heard that one of the dancers, she committed suicide afterwards, unfortunately. Dennis says that Andrea Strassmeyer and Strassmeyer's roommate from Elohim City called him from Lady Godiva that night. They tried to contact me to visit them uh, several times. They called me like, like eight times between 8 and 11 o'clock that day they were there. Any white man, red-blooded American male will go to Lady Godiva at least once if he's been in Tulsa more than a year. Andy Strassmeyer, all the boys like the, the women at Lady Godiva are the most beautiful in the, in the Tulsa. They're the best, uh, the best uh, ladies. So basically... Best genetics. What do you think of Dennis? Hmm, Dennis. He's kind of uh, a loony, you know? He's a little bit of a loony. Do you think he's working as a informant? Absolutely not. Definitely not. No, absolutely. I guarantee you Dennis Mahon is not. He would be absolutely worthless for, as an informer for anyone, you know? Were you ever an agent for any... U.S. No, never. agency. No, never, never. Did you have anything to do with the Oklahoma bomb? No, nothing at all. Which is worse, being considered part of the plot mm -hmm. to blow up the Moore Building, mm -hmm. or being considered an undercover agent? That's both offensive. I think it's offensive because it implies that I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah. I'm stupid. Which, which one? Both. Well, one, first insult, I'm a, I'm a snitch. I'm a, I'm a disloyal, dishonest person. Second, uh, I work for the BATF, an agency I really utterly despise because I think the government paid terrorists. So it's two insults in one, you know? And then the third insult, that I'm a stupid idiot who blows up innocent people and basically d does the government the biggest favor they can expect to help them to push their agenda through. There's a fourth one. Which, Which one is that? that you're an idiot for being an agent who failed to stop the bomb from happening? Absolutely. So we got four, yeah. So we, yeah. Exactly. We got four. Uh, you think you know all the conspiracy theories about me? Well, I heard them before. You did. Dennis seems secretly thrilled to be a central player in this alternative history of the Oklahoma bombing. Columbia Pictures are even considering making a movie about his love affair with Carol. We have a good movie. Yeah, it would. Who uh, would you have playing you? Uh, I hope that a guy like uh, uh, Tom Berenger, but uh, it might be the little Danny DeVito. <laughs> One guy said Danny DeVito's going to play me. You know, that'll, that'll, that'll devastate me. I'll, I'll leave the country. You know, that's a sad thing. Americans. Their legends and their heroes are more important than the actual truth. And that's the best message we can bring across, I think. So you think that the story of the mysterious German, do you yes, think but, yeah. that's a more compelling story? Oh, absolutely. It's a wonderful story. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't think of a better script for a great movie. Unfortunately, it's not true, you know. Dennis wants to take us on a pilgrimage to Kingman, Arizona, to the motel room where Timothy McVeigh stayed in the months before the bombing. Tim is going to the grave with the secrets he will not rat on his brothers, on his comrades. So, you know, you got to admit, what a soldier, what a, what a brave man and a courageous man. And it must have character not to rat on his 
his comrades, whoever they may be. This is for Tim McVeigh. Hail a true patriot. Hail Tim McVeigh. Hail Tim McVeigh, our hero. Tim McVeigh, my hero. It used to be said that the murder of JFK would only be resolved with a deathbed confession. There have so far been 28 deathbed confessions. Conspiracy theorists have long said that the truth of the Oklahoma bombing would only be revealed when McVeigh breaks his silence. McVeigh has now broken his silence. McVeigh denies ever being in a strip club with Andreas Strassmeyer. He says that he never met Richard Wayne Snell, really knew very little about his case, and he's also told us that he, he never visited Elohim City, where Richard Wayne Snell was buried. To him, it's, he describes it all as just being a coincidence. McVeigh did say that he called Elohim City uh, shortly before the bombing when he was coming up with contingencies again as a possible place where he could find cover after the bombing but and he asked for Andrea Strassmeyer but uh, he he wasn't there and I asked him about Carol Howe as well and he said she's good looking and he wouldn't mind having to put it uh, in softer terms relations with her He's the type of guy... But he never met her. He never met her. He's only seen pictures he's only, of her. Exactly. He's only seen pictures of her. For the conspiracy theories to still work, McVeigh would now have to be protecting people he presumes to be undercover agents of the New World Order. It's the silent brotherhood. That's what it all is. All of this is about. He is doing the patriot martyr. That's him. But if some of his co-conspirators are undercover informants why does he have allegiance to them well in for a penny in for a pound these are good questions you wonder about these things what is what goes on in his mind JD might actually be on to something McVeigh has changed his position on Elohim City over the years at first he denied ever telephoning the place McVeigh says well you know Yes, now that this phone call has come up, and now there is a record of me calling Elohim City, let me clarify that. <laughs> See, before he said, I don't know anything about those people. His story changes and evolves until finally what he is typical for doing is when he's getting a corner, he throws a childish fit. And he says, I don't want to hear any more of this conspiracy shit. There is something hard to give up about the conspiracy theories. The strip club and the mysterious German national makes for a more compelling narrative than that of a pop culture geek battling the evil empire. McVeigh's aim in blowing up the Moa building was to strike at the heart of the New World Order. But conspiracy theorists believe that the 3,000 FBI documents discovered just two days ago might prove that the New World Order itself played a part in the bombing. McVeigh is seething about this in his death row cell. He feels his last grand statement, his execution, has now been spoiled. <laughs> 